On the 9th of June, uh, in Whitehall, 15,000 or so supporters of Tommy Robinson, who is the ex-leader of the English Defence League, um, an ex-BNP member and, and, and a known Nazi and, ra and racist um, thug, um, came out I I into Whitehall to support Robinson after his arrest um, up, up in Leeds. We have to be clear what that sort of numbers mean, because the National Front, when it was in its pomp in Britain, a fascist organisation in the 1970s, didn't mobilise 15,000 people on the streets. As far as most people reckon, the British Union of Fascists didn't mobilise 15,000 people onto one demonstration in the 1930s. So this is a, a very big event and a very big thing to happen in British politics. The other thing that was interesting about it, if you can call it interesting, is it brought together a spectrum of people across what you could describe as a racist right in Britain. On the first bit of it, you had the real hardcore, people, may, people who would have seen the photographs of of some of Robinson supporters, Zeke Hylin, in, in Whitehall and the rest of it and stuff. These are the, the kind of hardcore Nazi elements and stuff around it. But he had other people there, um, a whole number of kind of very young hipster type alt-right figures, who, by the way, many of whom have joined UKIP over the last couple of days, were very evident on the demonstration. The supporters of groups, uh, members of groups like the Football Lads Alliance and the Democratic Football Lads Alliance, who weren't organising the demo, by the way, but, but were, were there in, in large numbers, but also so you had um, groupings like For Britain with Amory Waters, who people remember stood as, the, as for the leadership of, of UKIP and came second, and centrally Jared Batten, who is the leader of UKIP, were all on this demonstration. And when you think about the UKIP thing, it's very interesting. UKIP had, at one stage, four million votes in Britain when Nigel Farage was the leader of the party. And Nigel Farage always argued against these kind of street mobilisations. Actually, at one stage, during the Brexit campaign, UKIP called a demo. 100,000 people were going on Facebook at one stage. They pulled it because they didn't want that kind of approach. Actually, what you've got is Batten on the demonstration and afterwards, by the way, debating Wayman Bennett at one stage, explaining why there might have been a few bad apples on the Tommy Robinson demonstration, why he was proud to have stood alongside Patriots in, 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 inside Whitehall. So that was, there was, that was who was there from, 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 who was there from Britain. But also internationally, Tommy's friends also mobilised. Steve Bannon, who was the ex-chief of staff for Donald Trump, sent a personal message to the demonstration arguing why he was committed to getting Tommy Robinson out of jail. Gert Wilders, who is an absolutely notorious Dutch politician vicious Islamophobe, flew over and was brought in uh, with much kind of kerfuffle with an armed poli e police escort onto the demonstration to give, to give, um, to give his personal support for, for, uh, for Robinson. What united the people on the demonstration were two things. One was the fact that Tommy, who has gone from being a uh, marginal figure over the last couple of years in, in, in British politics, was the, the key figure to rally around. Gert Wilders summed it up when he said that Tommy was a hero because he was able to talk about things that other people wouldn't do. There was a placard on the demonstration you can see a picture of which says, Tommy Robinson, working class hero. That was the one central point of it. The other point of it was absolutely vicious. Islamophobia, right? So over it. The idea that, as Anne Marie Waters described it, that we are living under the iron heel of Islam, right? Stuff. Jared Batten and other people talking about the fact that there are two choices: you either surrender or you stand up to Islam. These are the two uniting factors. And what was the demonstration like? Well, after the Hitler salutes, once people had got bored and uh, attacked and tried to intimidate anti-racists who were on the demonstration, they then decided to turn on the old bill and they ran them down one. Right, all, right and stuff over like it. People seen the pictures and stuff of the police retreating, know what kind of demonstration that was. This was a few days after, by the way, we saw in Leeds, where when to what Tommy Robinson was sentenced, that three or four hundred of his supporters went on a rampage in the city centre, shouting Islamophobic slogans, and a couple of days later, a mosque was attacked and a Sikh temple was attacked as well. So we have to be clear about what is happening. This is the most serious attempt for years to attempt to reunite the, both the far-right elements but also populist racist elements inside, British, inside the British political movement it, into, into a real movement. It's the most serious attempt since the BNP um, disintegrated and since organisations like Unite Against Fascism and, and others were able to break up the English, the, the, the English, um, the English Defence Leagues. And like I said, that it's, a, it's a very strange concept that UKIP are now completely throwing in their lot 
with particularly the Democratic Football Lads Alliance and stuff. They are trying to win influence and support from a street army that they are openly asking to join UKIP and to be the political wing of the movement on, on, on the streets. Now, this would all be very interesting in some ways and stuff over it if the next stage of this was in six months' time or a year's time. The next stage of this is Saturday. That's the next stage of the, of, of the equation because on Saturday, what was initially a pro-Trump demonstration will be gathering in London. This will be the day after we hope that tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of us will be demonstrating against, against Donald Trump, a man, by the way, who's absolutely inspired the far right and the racist right across the globe. And the question for us is when some 10,000 or so of Tommy Robinson supporters turn up in Whitehall on Saturday, what will be facing them? And if they are able to turn London into a no-go zone for the left on Saturday, how long will it be before the target isn't Whitehall, before the target is Finsley Park Mosque or the East London Mosque? And this is a serious question that we have to go out now and argue over the next six days inside, inside the movement. Now, Lots of, particularly in the press, people are asking, how has this happened? There are lots of very concerned articles in The Guardian and other places after, Tommy, after the demonstration in support of Robinson and Whitehall, and people saying that something should be done. Uh, this is a process that's been going on particularly over the, the, the last year, and has been going on because of both factors inside British politics, but also international factors, uh, uh, international factors as well. And like I said, t t you can't really talk about this process without Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a man that when Nazis marched through Charlottesville, carrying torches and shouting, Jews will not replace us, said that there were good people on that demonstration. That is a signal, particularly after the death of Heather Heyer, right, on those demos, it is a signal to the far right and the racist right across the world that their ideas are acceptable. And that is a step change and stuff over it. He plays a very important role inside, inside that process. When he retreated Britain's first, Britain first tweets and, 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 and the rest of it. The second bit of it, though, is when you look at Europe, if you do a, a Cook's tour of Europe, it is not very cheerful. Let's go through some of the list just to spread the pain. Le Pen coming second in the French presidential election. Success for Gert Wilders in, in, in Holland. 94 MPs for the AFD, the alternative for Deutschland, inside the German parliament, 40 of whom are open Nazis, who were so intimidating that the leader of the AFD the, at one stage refused to sit in the same room as her own MPs because she was worried about physical assault. Look at Italy with the, with, with the government now of the five, of five Star and, and the Northern Leagues obsessed with the idea of stopping migrants coming in and prepared to see people drowning in the Mediterranean a, a, as a result of it. 60,000 Nazis, so 60,000, sorry, marching behind Nazi banners rather in Warsaw on a demonstration where the government comes out and says they are proud of the patriots that have come out to demonstrate on the streets. You look at Hungary with Viktor Orban talking about an international conspiracy run by George Soros. Where have we heard an international conspiracy before with, with Jobbik and the, and the fascists waiting in the wings? And we see increasingly an interplay between the, between the real hardcore far-right Nazis and right-wing populist movements. So you look at, at Austria, for example, with Sebastian Cruz and the Austrian People's Party. Really, in the last election, they outflanked the Freedom Party and the Nazis to the right on issues around Islam, on issues around, around, around migrants and the, and, and the rest of it. And the toxic brew that is now leading to the idea of shutting the southern migrant route camps for refugees who are coming through and migrants who are coming. This is nasty, nasty stuff that is leaking out across Europe, really, and, 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 where, and where the right are increasingly, are increasingly being able to, 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 to not just be a peripheral part, but are in the government. If you are in Austria, they are in the government, right? And stuff over it, including the interior ministry and stuff around it. And the language that is being used, particularly against Muslims, but against migrants, against refugees and the rest of it, 
is absolutely the same language that was used against the Jews in the 1930s. And shockingly enough, when you start with attacking Muslims, the older forms of racism come in behind and stuff over it. So across Europe, we see that Islam is used as a bridge to be acceptable, but anti-Semitism comes in right behind it with legislation and the language and the rest of it. The other point of it really is classically, these people are not simply starting with racism. They are not simply starting with the idea of blaming the other. They are starting with the reality that we are 10 years into austerity, that all the main political parties supported austerity, that working class people's lives have got worse and worse and worse, and that they are people who are prepared to stand up for the ordinary person. That's what Trump says. That's what the bloody trade wars are about. When he goes to the Virginia miners and turns around and says, oh, we open a pit. It may be bollocks, but he is feeling their pain. And that's what the right are trying to do across Europe feel the pain but also just as in the 1930s you start with defending the ordinary working person but you end up with who your minority is to blame and then it was the Jews now it's the Muslims it's the migrants it's the refugees and the the rest of it and if you read Steve Bannon's stuff and the rest of it they're really clear about developing a strategy internationally and trying to spread the arguments that Trump and Bannon and other people used in Britain things have been different We've got a nasty, vicious, horrible, racist government, but it's a Tory government. And the government really's main weapon has been institutional racism, right stuff. We see it with the hostile environment, right stuff. We see it with the Windrush scandal. We see the kind of ar- argument, really, that austerity and the rest of it, not us, Gov, really, it's about these migrants coming in, they're the people who are wrecking the NHS and the rest of it. But the fascist right have been extremely marginal over the last period, whether it's electorally or on the streets. And actually, even UKIP at one stage was a big monster, right, stuff with four million votes, has disintegrated electoral, particularly in the wake of the EU referendum. So that's been a situation for us. That is what is changing. And in lots of ways, the galvanising focus for this was the terror attacks in 2017. Because when Theresa May said enough is enough, actually some people acted on that. That was what the Finsbury Park mosque attack was about. When you say enough is enough, it is a dog whistle to people to go out and do a, li- a, little, a, li- a little more. But when they talk about extremism and the Muslim population as being an enemy within and, and, and the rest of it, it opens the door up. Now in London and Manchester, the response to the attacks was led by the left. It was led by social de- democrats, the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, call unity demonstrations, etc, etc. This is good stuff, whatever our political arguments are about it. Multi-faith gatherings and the rest of it. But there was another response to the attack, and particularly at London Bridge. That was in June 2017, and that was the Football Ads Alliance. That was the emergence of the Football Ads Alliance. It was a demonstration, I remember talking to the old Bill about some other demonstration. Me and Wayman were at, 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 at we're talking to people and they said, oh, we were expecting three or four hundred football fans to come out and stuff on, on, on Saturday and lay a reef at London Bridge. What happened was 6,000 people turned up onto the demonstration, no colours, no chanting from different football firms and the rest of it. And the message that came out of that demonstration was absolutely clear. Despite all its protestations of again against extremism, not being racist and the rest of it, was that the Muslim community was, was, was the problem. That was the argument at the, at the centre of it. In, 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 the FLA themselves, the Football Ads Alliance, were led by John Meehan at the time. He's a very well-known uh, Spurs hooligan, really, and stuff. But his argument was that the FLA was not of the left and was not of the right. It was certainly not racist. It was against extremism. It was about doing something. It was as much against the attacks at London Bridge as it was against the attacks at Finsley Park Moss. That was their, that, that was their argument. We've got to remember one thing, though. That if people remember about the English Defence Leagues, the English Defence Leagues in the wake of the Defile Rigby started by burning the swastika. They started by arguing that they were neither of the left nor the right. They started by arguing that they were defending white working class culture. And actually, if you remember, Remember, paper, newspapers like The Observer fell over themselves in love with the concept that somebody would, like Tommy Robinson would stand up for the white working classes. They were also described, by the way, at one stage as a human rights organisation. Right, stuff over it. So, 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 well, you know, we laugh now, right, stuff about it. But the FLA started very much with this argument. And they really courted at the beginning 
Respectability. They tried to get a veterans charity, Walking With Wounded, to back their demonstration last October in London. They would have done it, by the way, unless the fact that anti-racists hadn't pointed out a slight problem. If you go onto the closed Facebook page for the Football Lads Alliance at the time and had a brief view, you got two or three things. Firstly, the most vicious Islamophobia you could possibly find, leading up to, by the way, support and sympathy for the Fimsy Park bombing attack. The second thing that went alongside that, once... Um, Diane Abbott, uh, uh, the Shadow Home Secretary, had signed a statement that, that, that Stand Up to Racism put out expressing concern about the Football Ads Alliance was the most vicious racist assaults and, uh, 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 um, on, on Diane Abbott. One of them that sticks in my mind all the time is they said she, she should be deported so she could send, spend more time with her primates. Right, that's a favourite. This is the kind of language that was being used on the sites, not shockingly, the charity pulled. I'm sure Prince Harry would have been a bit worried if, 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 if it was one of the sponsors of it and stuff, would have been a bit worried if they, if, they hadn't, if they hadn't done so. But when they marched in October, last October, there were 20,000 people on the Football Lads Alliance demonstration. By the time it got to Whitehall, where we were, I was part of a... Um, at the time, if you remember, the Football Ads Alliance said it wasn't racist, etc., etc. So we were leafleting the demonstration. Because they weren't racist, they shouldn't have been worried about us. It was a fairly hairy experience, to be quite honest with you. Because after about five seconds, when the front of the demonstration had gone by, the beer cans were going in, the punches were going in, etc., etc., et and stuff about it. But by putting up an argument about what the FLA was about, it had an effect. And, and from... The, the Stand Up to Racism, UAF and papers like Socialist Work are putting up arguments. The argument has spread into the national press to the stage where now there are BBC TV programmes on in the daytime discussing the Football Lads, um, the F Football Lads Alliance and, 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 and the rest of it. By the time we got to March this year, when in, there was a mobilisation in Birmingham, right, and stuff over it, although there were 4,000 people, by the way, these are big numbers and stuff over it, the FLA had split into two component parts, the FLA and the Democratic FLA. Partly this is about politics and strategy, partly it was about money, because once you start selling badges and selling Stone Island clothing and the rest of the stuff about it, there's always going to be a row, um, there's always going to be a row in, 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 in the middle of it. By the situation in Birmingham, by the way, number one, UKIP were completely on board and have been having meetings with the Democratic Football Ads Alliance in Parliament to talk about the strategy that they got. And the second thing is Tommy Robinson, who to begin with was not welcome on FLA demonstrations at all, was told to leave the demonstration, had suddenly become the poster boy of the demonstrations. Everybody wanted a selfie with Tommy. And when John Meehan, the, the thing really was his suicide note for the FLA, stood up and said, oh, I think Tommy has upstaged me, hasn't he really, and stuff over it. You knew, what, what, you, you knew exactly what was happening. By May in Manchester and Comrades are here from Manchester and the rest of you can talk about it. The FLA demonstrate one day with a poxy turnout. The, the D Democratic FLA are out in much bigger numbers a week later and the rest of it. And so now, eventually, if you follow all the letters together, the FLA is now part of the DFLA, right? And stuff over it just to keep up as, as, as we, go, as we go, go along. But I want to really try to get the main point, to tr try and get really to the main point of the argument here, really. Because I think after the 9th of June, lots of people have woken up to what is going on here, right, stuff like over it. And lots of people inside the movement are now talking about what you do about this, 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 this situation. But to be honest with you, there has been huge levels of complacency Right and stuff up until this point. And maybe it's understandable for two reasons, really. Robinson's last attempt to reorganise the, 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 the right stuff after the EDL was Pegida UK. Pegida UK went down the toilet. It didn't do what Pegida did in, in, in Germany, where the street movement fed into the AFD and a mass movement and stuff over it. It failed fairly miserably. The second thing of it is, the other thing to be honest about, is the Labour movement has got a different priority than up until this stage. Once UKIP's electoral strategy had collapsed, they're not so much of a problem. What's the the main priority for the Labour movement. It's getting Jeremy elected, right, and stuff over it. And so having your eye on what happens in Whitehall wasn't first in people's minds. I think at the, at the beginning, at the minute, by the way, I think it is. Len McCluskey's article in the Daily Mirror over a, a week or so ago is a really important thing to see in, lo in lots of ways. Jeremy Corbyn is now called for unity on the left across Europe against the far right. People saw the statement that was launched by Stand Up to Racism that was launched in The Guardian has dozens of MPs, councillors, trade union leaders and, and, all, and, and all the rest of it and stuff. And these signatures are important, by the way, right? because it starts saying that worrying about Robinson it isn't just about a matter for the far right, it's a matter for the entire movement. And partly while the unions are waking up, 
up is you find out as you talk to people that the unions are starting to have their activists on the demonstrations with the FLA, with the DFLA, with, the, with Tommy Robinson and the right. It's a real problem that has, to be, that has to be taken on. And there are positive signs over the last couple of days. Yesterday I had the privilege of being in Leeds. There were 700, 800 or people or so out on the streets writing stuff over it. When we think where we were when Robinson was imprisoned and they went on the rampage, yesterday there were seven or eight to one anti-racists against the racists that are uh, supporting Tommy Robinson. And it was... And it was and hopefully Sam, Sam and other comrades from Leeds can talk about that. The last time, like I said, the FLA marched in, in, in Manchester, there were 600 anti-racists and, 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 and the rest of it too, really, and stuff. So this is all important. That's very good. But let's also have a bit of a reality check and be honest about a situation. The last time, that, that on, on the 9th of June, when there were 15,000 on the streets, there were 400 anti-racists challenging them. Right, stuff over it. And that is a big gap. Right, stuff over it. And actually, we have to think about what will we feel like on Saturday night or Sunday morning if we know that on Friday we can get 100,000 out to demonstrate against a racist like Trump from America, but when it comes to our own homegrown Nazi, we can't get the numbers out on the streets. That will not have a good effect on, 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 our, on, our, on, our, on our movement at all. So we have to start talking about what we do about our own little version of Charlottesville. And our own little version of Charlottesville, like I said, is coming to you at two o'clock next Saturday afternoon. So this seems to me to be the central point of the end of, of the end of, 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 the, of the discussion, really. See, the first thing is we have to put up a big argument here, really, which is simply being against austerity does not immunise the working class from racism. Some people think, you go, you know, there's strike demonstrations for the health service, this sorts out the problem. I'm sorry it doesn't, because we all know that working class people can be pulled by a number of different ideas. And so therefore, we need a mass movement that starts going into every working class community, every workplace, and starting to arm the best people with the arguments. Why freedom of movement and migrants don't undermine your wages, etc., etc. Et and we also have to be capable of producing genuinely mass mobile organizations against the far right when they come out on, onto, onto the streets. And by the way, this is neat. there are two versions of this argument. One is the only way you can take on the likes of Robinson is if you're a street fighter. So on Saturday you should come down, but if you, if you should come down if you're prepared to rock. That's one argument. It's a wrong argument, right? Stuff about it, because you'll never mobilise anybody that way. The other idea, and we've seen it from some people who should have known better, is it's fine. March on Friday. Good. March on Friday. That deals with the problem. Right, stuff. I'm sorry, it doesn't deal with the problem if you can get the left out on one day and the right march on the other day. We've seen this strategy. It's called France. Right, stuff. We've seen it. It's called Le Pen. We've seen it. It's called the Front National and the growth that they had and stuff. At some point, our entire experience is you have to confront these people with the numbers that, 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 can, that, can, that, that can actually deal with them. And at the heart of this argument is a revolutionary socialist strategy. See, in Stand Up to Racism, we're absolutely proud to work with the vast, major I mean, the vast majority of activists in Stand Up to Racism are Labour Party members and supporters. And we're really proud of that. And we're really proud that people like Diane Abbott and other people have come out and put themselves in harm's way in order to make those arguments. But we've got to remember that at the heart of the conception of a united front, the heart of the conception of how you deal with fascism is a set of ideas that go back to Leon Trotsky and the revolutionary tradition. And we're proud of that too, to be honest. We're proud that revolutionary organisations, even small revolutionary organisations, can make a difference and have an influence. And that's when we talk about the anti-Nazi league that was a truly mass movement against fascism. And that's when we talk about United, United Against Fascism that broke the BMP and broke the EDL, that's what they are able to do. It's based on these, on these kind of ideas. Last two things and I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. See, the thing is, next Saturday is an absolutely massive test. That's the truth. What's about it? You know, I think on, on Friday, the, you know, the bottom line is there will be 100,000 people marching in London. Maybe there will be a quarter of a million. This is absolutely brilliant, right? So about it. But in some ways, this is almost an organic process now. When you've got the big baby balloon above London, you know, this is going to happen. The real thing is, what, what happens if they make the breakthrough on Saturday? Because the right have a plan now, and the plan is simple. Theresa May is going to sell out, as it were, over Brexit. 
Corbyn and co, they believe, are going to sell out over Brexit. They believe they'll go for a second referendum or the rest of it. And so therefore, working class people will feel betrayed. If you put that on top of a general populist argument against Muslims, against migrants, against refugees and the rest of it, and you put Tommy into the mix, you have a plan. Tommy, by the way, now is kind of like in the position that Adolf Hitler was. He's in Landsberg prison. It's 1923 and he's out in 13 months time. What do you think Tommy will do when he gets out. He ain't going into retirement. Right, so he'll be in your town. That's where Tommy will be. He'll be in your town or your borough in London and he'll be doing a meeting on freedom of speech and why we have to stand up for white working class people. That's what Tommy will do. We already know that a businessman is putting the money up for the open top bus to take him around the country. And so what will happen in your town when Tommy gets out? What will happen to us when they call the national demonstration to welcome Tommy when he gets out? And by the way, you UKIP may look like a joke now, but don't think they'll remain a joke if the Tories fucking over Brexit like we know they will and if some people in the Labour Party get their way over the way they want to respond to Brexit and stuff. So they have a strategy now and the strategy centres at the moment on Robinson. So I need to finish, don't I? But, I'll, but have I got yet? But, 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 but I will finish really. We're just saying this because in lots of ways this is the audience participation section of the meeting. Because at the minute it is, it is out there what will happen on Saturday. See, I don't believe that we'll get to match the numbers that they'll get on, on, on Saturday in central London and stuff over it. But I do think we can make a step change. I think we can make a step change inside the movement. When the RMT say they are aiming at getting 100 members out with banners, with stewards and the rest of it and stuff over it, that means that trade union is taking the bloody issue of the growth of fascism seriously. They are mobilising. When Peter Kavanagh, who's often somebody we may have had the odd argument with in the past, who's the organiser in London for Unite, he's down as the speaker. And by the way, when people like Claude Merez and people and stuff who are MEPs put themselves in harm, harm's way to speak on Saturday, and the rest of it, we know sections of the movement are taking it seriously. But it means we've got to fight like fuck. Every hour this week, everybody who's on the Trump demonstrations, there has to be an argument. Yeah, we're coming out against the two of the bastards. We're coming out against Trump, but we're coming out against Tommy too. And if we don't do that, we're missing a big part of the equation. Right, so over it. And that means we have to fight really hard this week. In London, you have to be out outside the tube stations, leafleting, getting people down, getting people down to steward on the demonstration on the Saturday so that people feel they can come if they're not an expert in jiu-jitsu and etc, etc and stuff around. We have to create an atmosphere that anti-racists are the majority in this country. And at the minute, we can nip this thing in the bud. That's the truth. Right, so if our movement stopped the National Front when in other countries the fascist movements were on the rise and looking to the National Front. We stopped the BNP when they had bloody MEPs and they had councillors and they were killing people in South East London. We stopped the EDL when then people were fucking going amok in places and were saying they represented white working class people. But it matters what happens on Saturday because it's a launch pad right, so for what happens in the rest of the country when they try and march in Scotland as well, when they try and march in Wales and the rest of it. And we, to be honest with her, there are little pivotal moments in history. Yes, uh, yesterday I went to a meeting on the Rivers of Blood speech and people talked about how important that was and how important the response was. People will talk about what happens next Saturday for years after because it will shape what happens to the far right in this country. And we've got to say to socialists and to trade unionists and to anti-racists, you have to be out on Friday yes, in your tens and hundreds of thousands right? but we cannot hand central London over to a bunch of fucking bigots next Saturday without bringing people out. There's a slogan in our movement that goes back from Spain. It says, no passer on. That's what it says, no passer on. And we have to start making that into a reality in the country. And it starts at Whitehall at one o'clock at Old Palace Yard, marching up to Whitehall for two o'clock on Saturday afternoon. Um, I'm just worried about... Um the, the level of violence that will ensue on uh, when um, next Friday when Trump comes. I'm just wondering, you know, um, you talk about strategy. I'm just wondering, you know, what the strategy will be because the anti, I'm sorry, the pro-Trump people will, will be in numbers. We need to be in numbers as well. So, you know, what is a strategy that we need to take so that we don't get hurt? Yeah, I think there's another slogan we have to remember, and it really addresses the violence thing. We are many, they are few. The reality is, the more people there, the safer it will be. I'm, I'm 61, okay? 
And, and I, you know, there are older people than me, there are younger people than me. We need to show what Britain is about. It's not about uh, what the, these, their version of what, what society is like. It's multicultural, it's young and old, it's everybody. Now, I'm absolutely sure that on the day there'll be organisation to keep people safe. We do have to be prepared to try and stop the marching, but this isn't some combat exercise, it's about numbers. And I'm trying to think now, of what I've got to do. I'm, I'm in work next week for three days, so I'm working out a timetable in my head of who I'm going to see, who I'm going to ring, who I'm going to Facebook, and who I'm going to meet on Saturday that, I, if necessary, I get them to bloody well stay in my house uh, on Friday, stay over to Saturday and come along as well. We're on a mission now, and I think that actually means that we've got individual responsibility, but also those of us in our unions, we've got collective responsibility as well. The safety is in numbers, and I think that's what we've got to work on. OK, thanks. I didn't actually call you comrades, so you snuck that one in, but I'll let you off. Um, so it is this woman here, and then you next, and then Wayman next. Hi, it's Becky from Leeds, and we did have a good day yesterday, and it wasn't um, everything we'd want. We didn't have enough numbers to um, force the police to let us uh, march when the fascists were, were meeting, but we did march afterwards, but it was absolutely um, a, a change from what we've had before. Sorry, I've been called quite quickly. I haven't written all my notes. There were two demonstrations by fascists yesterday called in Leeds. There was Tommy Robinson. They cancelled it, quote, because of the football, but I think we should assume that maybe a level of that, but actually their nervousness about a big demonstration. Also a group called the Yorkshire Patriots, I don't know if other comrades know, I'm not quite clear about their relationship with each other, but they obviously weren't meeting together. Um, Antifa were very much up for, a, for a confrontation with them. They attempted to do that. Um, some limited success kind of getting close to them, but actually they ended up kettled for a long, kettled for a long period of time. We had a demonstration, a, a rally, and it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, lots and lots of trade unions. I know other comrades are going to talk uh, about how, how that kind of came about. And there was an audible gasp from some people when Hillary Benn MP was announced as one of the speakers. I think that's a real big change and I think that was um, kind of quite uh, quite surprising for people and is absolutely brilliant and, and shows that how seriously the Labour Party in Leeds are, are sort of starting um, starting to take it uh, and then when we did march we got to uh, Antifa who'd been kettled and, and the police um, sort of said well do, are you happy for them to join you and they got out of the kettle and joined the back of the demonstration and so we all ended up uh, coming into Leeds um, together and the final thing I'm going to just say about is MEND, I don't know about other places Muslim engagement and development, I think they've, they vary as an organisation nationally and locally, but we have developed a relationship with them. They were yes, there yesterday. Uh, a member from MEND did part of the call to prayer from the, um, from the uh, megaphone at the start, which was brilliant. Um, a woman spoke, and she was fantastic, and she said, I'm a Muslim woman, I wear the hijab. She directly spoke to Tommy Robinson's support, and she says, I'm here with the support of my family. No man tells me what to do. She was brilliant. There was a man from MEND, and they stood behind the banner. There was not one single member of the SWP behind the Stand Up to Racism banner yesterday as it marched through Leeds. It was a multicultural demonstration. It was really fantastic. We needed more numbers. We should have been able uh, to get closer to the fascists, but it was a huge uh, step forward, and, and, and good luck in London on Saturday. Yeah, I think the, fir you know, the first thing to say is, when you see those dem that demonstration of 15,000 fascists, it sickens you to the stomach, and potentially it can terrify and paralyse you as well, and feel like just pulling the quilt over your head and pretending it's not happening and hoping it's it goes away, which is the worst thing we can possibly do. I think the thing that inspired me was very quickly afterwards, I think it was a demonstration in Lewisham to shut down the For Britain organisation, which kind of put it back into your head the ways in which we've organised and defeated these people um, in the past. I'm from Wakefield. There were actually three fascist demonstrations in West Yorkshire yesterday. There was one in Wakefield um, as well. And we called a Stand Up to Racism um, organising meeting. 25 people at the first organising meeting. 45 people a week later. Made up of young women from MEND, people from the Labour Party, people from the trade unions. And we voted unanimously, 45 to 0, with no, um, no one um, voting against it, to walk Occupy the ground which the National Front were going to claim yesterday. We were threatened with Section 14 dispersal orders and all sorts of things by the police. I think the thing that amazed me most is the way how quickly the Labour Party came on board. 
how quickly the Labour Party came on board and the mosques came on board. The chair of the district Labour Party came to the Stand Up to Racism organising meeting last Tuesday and promised to bring the district banner to it. The chair of one of the biggest mosques in Wakefield did a, 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 vid, a video thing that we put onto um, YouTube and what, uh, onto Facebook calling on people to um, attend, you know, attend the, the, um, the, the demonstration. I think that's really important for us. The trade unions have got six million members. The Labour Party has got hundreds of thousands of members. And they are, yes, they are focused on the elections, but lots of them have, have marched alongside us and fought alongside us for years in the anti-war movement and the anti-racist movement, and they are as concerned as we are. And we can, we can, we can organise and we can, we can mobilise those people. So, yeah, we outnumbered them in Leeds um, yesterday quite considerably. We also outnumbered them um, in Wakefield. I think they got 20. Uh, we got something like 250 and marched through the middle of the town and took, <laughs> took, that, town, took that town over. Yeah. I know that's not big enough numbers to deal with um, the fascists next uh, on Saturday, but that's the model. Pull the activists together, get them out there, get the messages out there, and I'm, I'm convinced we can, we can break this fascist movement sooner rather than later. I want to start off by saying that I thought that what Michael said in terms of the deadline is absolutely there. And the truth is that we have to use the Trump demonstration as well. The tr when you look at the petition, every single general secretary has signed that petition. They've all signed it. And that means there's a potential in our workplaces and over the next two days to act three days to transform what we've got to do. We shouldn't accept that automatically that it's going to be a simple battle, but it does come down to numbers. To be honest, I'm sick and tired of people talking about macro crap, that you need somebody big. It's good to have people big and strong, by the way. But it's, it's not true. What matters to us is the numbers that we have in terms of bringing people out that makes us have some kind of size. We need that size, and it's going to be a test. It is going to be a test about what we do on Saturday, but I do think we have the potential to do that. Umesh Desai is the commissioner for the police. Well, he's not the commissioner. He sits on the police committee, and he's going to come down and stand next to us on the demonstration. The reason why he's been asked to come and stand next to us is a commitment from the Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn made a video on the NHS demonstration that supported both demonstrations. Therefore, we have the potential to do that. But the reason why this party is important is because we make the connection. It's not an accident, and it's not a criticism of our brothers and sisters inside the Labour Party, but when the question of racism and fascism comes up, it's not an accident that the tradition that we have in this organisation shapes what happens, that we take an argument about why it's important. There was an argument when Michael and I went to see the Football Federation that said that they were going to disappear automatically. They'll fight amongst each other. And now the very same people are saying, you're right, we're going to come out and support you. We have to turn that into something real in terms of the way that we stand together. I'll tell you why it's important. I don't believe this is going to be a small argument. What's happening inside all the other European countries will, will happen here. It's a long-term argument, but we have to start somewhere. And what happens now, and what happens on Saturday, will be the test. But I think it's about something else that I want to say. You know Tommy Robinson, you know what he is? And Trump, they talk about being against the establishment. When they say they want working class heroes, actually, to a certain extent, they're right. When you listen to the first stuff they say, they, you know what he says? We're treated like shit. That's what he said by the people at the top of our society. The problem is, he is the shit. He deserves to be treated like shit because he's a racist Nazi thug. And we want to treat him like that. The question is, what type of leadership is going to take its place? In London, we're well placed. I tell you who's coming. The people from Finsley Park are coming. The imam from East London is going to come down on the demonstration. Why do you think they're coming? Because they want to start that fight there and they stand with us and we've won a tradition. Do you know what the person said from East London Mosque? He said, my tradition is black and white, unite and fight. You know where that slogan came from? <laughs> it's a tradition. It's a tradition. But I tell you, tradition, history means nothing. It wasn't history that stormed the Winter Palace. It's not history that made Lewisham. It's not history doesn't do anything. I tell you what does things. People do things. We do things. And therefore, what we have to do on that day, on the, on the Friday, we have to make sure that everybody comes with us against Trump. We have to have that. But we have to make sure that we take a group of people and say we understand on the streets 
on Saturday, and what we're representing is that international tradition that's going to stop them. Come stand with us. We will make that stand. And we, when people talk about history, I guarantee you, one day people are going to turn around and say they were there, like they're doing Lewisham. If everybody had been there, half the population of the world had been there, right? But actually, they were there with us in spirit, and we have to turn that spirit into action. So just to say, I have seen you. I did let you know I'd seen you. Just to say that I've got about, I have seen you, and I've put you down. I've got about 10 people on this, so if you'll keep it short, we'll, we'll try and fit you in. But I'd say no more. After that, though. Okay. okay, I'm Sam. I'm really, really proud to have been in Leeds yesterday. It was an absolutely fantastic day. I want to talk about why it was so... Im how it happened, really. We've all seen demonstrations, haven't we, where the union leadership put their logos on leaflets. What happened in Leeds was we got eight unions coming in one after another at regional level, including the TUC, which hasn't happened for a long time, wanting to support the demonstration. They didn't just do that, though, because we've all seen those sort of logos go on leaflets before. They actually put something into action as well. And I think what Leeds showed yesterday was there is a significant shift since the 15,000 in terms of the unions actually doing something. And my message to you really is, there is a bit of an open door at the moment. So what did Unite do? Well, the regional secretary sent an email to 10,000 Unite members in Yorkshire telling them to come to Leeds. Ten of them didn't like that very much because they support Tommy Robinson and complained about it. Now, there's a bit of an argument now, isn't there? Because the United say, well, we'll have to review their membership. Actually, no, let's have a discussion with them. Actually, go get those United full-timers and go and talk to those people because they're probably not Nazis because most people aren't. What did the GMB do? The GMB also told all their members about it. Now, they didn't all turn up, but the point is there's publicity. What did Unison in Leeds do? It told all its members about it. So the union bureaucracy has actually started to shift on things. There is a bit of an open door here at the moment. Unite photocopied leaflets and posters for us. They, Unite and GMB sent lots of flags. They sent their full-timers to the, to the demonstration yesterday. Um, we had speakers from all over the place. We had two Labour MPs on our platform. That is unprecedented in Leeds. And people were right, you know, Facebook comments, Hillary Bin was on the demonstration, and Richard Bergen. It doesn't happen, people. 20 Labour councillors were in the audience yesterday. That is the shift that has taken place. Where did that come from? It didn't just come from us, right? It's because the Labour Party membership have started to realise we need to do something. The union bureaucracy have started to say, we need to do something. So you need to go to your unions and say, what are we doing about it? Len McCluskey has opened the door as well by that article um, in the mirror. I mean, the fact that Tommy Robinson people cancelled their demonstration has got nothing to do with the football. They were going to have their demonstration and then go to the football. It was all planned in time. They cancelled because they were worried about numbers. If you and your colleagues or get an email from your union regional secretary say, go to this demonstration and don't talk to Tommy Robinson, you're going to be a bit worried. Well, let's make them worried. Get your union regional secretary to send out an email to every member. Get your branch secretary to start sending stuff out as well. These people that are on the Tommy Robinson demonstration, most of them probably trade unionists. Well, let's use the union organisation to put the argument to them and break them away from the hardcore Nazis. We can do this, people. We showed it in Leeds yesterday. <laughs> Yeah, comrades, um, during his talk, Michael mentioned the, uh, the NF and the, uh, the National Fund in the 1970s and about how big they were and how angry they were. And someone also mentioned a question about violence. And actually, I want to tell you what happens about violence when you leave these people to grow un un unchecked. Despite my youthful looks, I actually grew up in the, uh, in the 1970s and early 1980s. And actually, I grew, I grew up in a place called Hoxton, just down the road. Um, and actually, it was a, a place where the National Front had their headquarters. And it was a really, really scary time. I've told you, a few people in this room have heard this before, but I'm never going to get tired of saying this. Because actually, when I was a little kid, I remember walking down Hoxton Market, being spat at by people being called nigger. But the, um, the, um, the National Front used to sell their paper, Bulldog. 
there needs to be skinheads down there. There's a piece of the road down in Hoxton called Not Not Old Street. And actually, what happened was there was a um, massive sign there that said, Wogs out, Packies go home. And actually, the atmosphere was so vile that people used to talk about going packy bashing as like going around beating up Asians as a recreational hell. We used to openly talk about it. What happened? I remember being a really, really scared young boy walking down the street with my little sister being absolutely petrified. Why do these people hate me so much? What happened to change that? Actually, anti-racist took to the streets. Rock against racism, things like that. And as a little boy, I then began to see that actually not everyone hated me because people were wearing anti, you know, badges stuff. Actually, I didn't, I didn't really get involved in it because I was quite young, but the fact that people were on the streets doing it made a real, real difference. So this is why it's really, really important now. And actually, what's really funny is actually my mum, well, not really funny, my mum was just being placed in a, in, a, in a care home, which is on Nuttall Street now. So I have to cycle through there quite a lot. And actually, at the bottom of that road now, there's a, there's, a cap, uh, there's a West Indian takeaway called Taste of Jamaica. So we've gone from Wag, Wag, Wag's out and Packy's home to a Taste of Jamaica in that place. So it's really, really... <laughs> I mean, it was shut today when I wanted to get some lunch, but apart from that. But, um, but I'll just tell you, so... Can you start to finish, please? I will start to finish. One thing I will say, I'm um, actually... I think Union Brewcats are taking the stuff seriously. At my, I'm a member of Visit in Unison, and I'm, I'm really proud that actually on my branch committee on Thursday, that actually they talked about the Trump demonstration, taking it really, really seriously, and actually mobilising, meeting points, and all of this stuff. But I had to turn around and say, well, actually, guys, there's also a demonstration that we should be putting as much effort to, into on the next day. So I think it's really great that people are waking up, but actually we need to win the argument that it's about having a critical mass of people and actually the demonstration is not just the anti-fascists not going and have a fight with the Nazis, actually all of us, and the anti-racism movement is for everyone. OK, I'm going to limit people to two minutes now. Hi, can we hear me? Oops. Yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, um, Roger, Roger Lewis from uh, 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 South London. To be honest, comrades, building stand up to racism in Brixton is not the hardest thing in the world. Uh, there are harder places, but, but uh, what, building it in the workplace has been a different matter. I'm in Lambeth Unison, and I'm sure as comrades will, 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 will know, working in the unions as an SWP member is not always the easiest place and hasn't been for some time. But we built stand up to racism very effectively in South London, and we were there on the first uh, demonstration against the FLA when there were just a handful of us really leafleting them uh, to try and, try and split the racist away from the hardcore. Um, we had disabled people, we had, uh, we had pensioners, we had black people, we had trade unionists. We got that back, helped us build locally, but nothing in the trade unions. Still hard to get anything going on in there around stand up to racism. But then something happened. Something happened was Windrush. And, we, and, and what happened locally, we had all these other things on, and some, so we said, shall we, shall we try putting something on? Shall we call something? We called a protest to Windrush Square in Brixton on the Monday. On the Friday, we had 1,000 people out in Brixton, in, in Windrush Square, with uh, Diane Abbott speaking on the platform. Platform, Gary Young, fantastic, absolutely brilliant, but more importantly, we had the Lambeth Unis and Black Workers Group banner out there. Now, that's the first time that's happened in decades. And, 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 and with that, we had one of their members, Henry, who's a black activist, who was on the platform and spoke absolutely brilliantly. And another, another, another trade unionist, Jocelyn, who came along, identifying with Stand Up to Racism, identifying with the SWP within Stand Up to Racism. They took that back into the workplace. Jocelyn organised and organised and went on the Calais trip uh, that we, we had organised and came back and put that up on the website and pushed it around the council. Our advertising, we showed a film showing. The council put it out on the general email list and Stand Up To Racism's name was in it. But crucially, Jocelyn then also came on, that, on, on, on the next big uh, uh, DFLA demonstration. Uh, and, 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 and that made the connection, that broke it for us in, 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 in terms of building in, in the council. That's continued, that's been a hard fight, but we're getting there. What that happened was three weeks ago, we had a momentum, we had, we had a, a meeting where our branch secretary uh, from, once uh, uh, momentum came along, four black speakers on the platform, brought there by Jocelyn, and he said, uh, you know, this is right. I've got to do something. I've got to get out. We've got to turn out. Finish, now momentum please. are building uh, and, and, and they're joining in. Building all of those things together is how we, how we beat the fascists and beat the Nazis. Everyone's looking really impatient, but I've got lots of people on the list and I can only pick one person at a time. So if I am able to pick you, then I'm sorry. Hi, comrades. Um, 
just to the people who are saying, obviously, um, confronting Nazis can get violent. Um, don't be scared to go out and confront these people. I, was, I, I wasn't sadly in Wakefield or Leeds um, yesterday, so big up to the comrades who were. Um, but I was, in, I, was in, sorry, I was in London um, on the 7th, and it was the biggest demonstration that I've seen of um, far-right people. It was quite scary being there. We were massively outnumbered. Um, but the, the solidarity that we felt um, on the other side of the police to these awful, awful people um, was huge, and we came out feeling a lot stronger for it. Um, but obviously, we do need more people on, um, who are there turning out and telling these people that they're not welcome. Um, to people who are scared, I'd say pair up with people, um, organise before the protest, have safe words if you are if you are feeling scared, um, but whatever you do, get out on the streets and do oppose these people. It's better to oppose them now when they're small than in a year or two years' time when Tommy gets out of prison and they've got a bit of momentum because he's back out. Um, it's better to put the fear into them now than to when the leader's back out of jail. Um, to people who are thinking that like they don't have stand-up to racing in their area or anything like that, um, don't wait for um, permission to start um, building your own movements um, in your own area. If it is stand-up to racism, go out, start it on your own. Because um, it is grassroots, uh, grassroots movements that actually start momentum growing, um, even if it is in small villages where you've got racist people. Go knock on the doors anyway and have these conversations because that's the only way you're going to change things. Um, we do need to destroy this movement now um, because it, it is a growing movement. Obviously, we are in hard times, but ours is a growing movement as well. Um, and it is the time to act. Thank you. I don't know if people saw yesterday, there were, um, central London, there, were, there was a case of Ikea getting uh, smashed up a little bit by England fans, in, in inverted commas. Now, shock horror, unfortunately no one got hurt, but you may have seen two of the people, understandably, really nervous about it, in the background, were two Muslim women in hijabs and so on, who got shit, right? They didn't get attacked physically, but they got grief. Shock horror on the DFLA private wall last night, Whoa, wasn't that good? Not all of them, but a number of them. That's how low these people are, as we know. They also have a problem, though, to be, to be honest, the DFLA. There's an internal tension going along, which you wouldn't make too much of at all, but there are internal tensions. So, for instance, when they had a march recently, about 2,500, not a small march, but a number of them thought there'd be a lot more, a lot more. And again, on the private wall, unfortunately for them, which we've got access to, where the fuck was everyone? Why weren't there more firms there? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see the tensions going on here. The other thing as well is, because we've got people in and around the DFLA who know what's going on, the fact that it's been taken from them to a large degree, the Free Tommy campaign, is now being run by UKIP, Raham, Raham Kasim. Ex, who's linked to Steve Bannon, ex Breitbart scum, and various other people with money, influence, and access to the House of Lords, um, and so on. They are not happy about this. And hang on, hang on. We can see something's not wrong here. Why wrong here? Why are we, why are we, we, why are we being used as foot soldiers? The more clever ones, and there are clever ones in the DFLA. What's that? We was part of the whole thing. They've had people kicked off Facebook admin sites, etc., etc. So they have their own internal problems going on as well. Would make too much of it, but they do. Last thing, um, the, tra the trade union stuff. Because, as, as Wayman and Michael have said, every major trade union and smaller unions have signed, signed a recent statement, it's an open door. It's an open door. So to the person from the RMT, last week met up with the RMT, I expected one EC member to be with me. There were four EC members at Chelton Street last Monday. They've been on the phone two nights last week. They're going around stations. They're doing this, they're doing that. Tomorrow morning, I'm leafleting with them. I, I discover uh, about 20, 10 minutes ago. Um, in, uh, there's three different stations just in South London being done. There's other stations being done. That's by RMT. I could go on about CW and PCS. Who knows what will come from it, but they're very serious about it. In terms of safety, some of the people providing stewards, RMT, CW, PCS, other trade units and so on. So we are absolutely on to that for, for the obvious reasons. Last thing is the momentum branches as well. The momentum branches, we've been contacted the office day in, day out now by a number of momentum branches who were seriously mobilising for it for a whole number of reasons, but I think, as people said, it's, the, the call is people realise what's going on. It's a real challenge for us. I'm sure we can pass it, and it's true. Whatever happens on the 14th will we'll be judged accordingly, but there are a lot of people on our side about this. If we get it right politically and organisationally, we, we, can, we can start to turn the tide. With these people, if England win the World Cup, for instance, 
these people will be really heartened by it. But also, but there's also always a reaction to these Can you finish, people. please, Paul? So we, we, we have to be confident, but we have to be urgent about the thing as well. OK, uh, a couple of things. Um, uh, Mike mentioned... Uh, he asked uh, comrades in the room to think, how would you feel once Tommy's out and it's part of the Tommy Robinson tour? Uh, imagine what the situation will feel like. Uh, we had a, a similar sort of discussion in Lewisham as um, Anne-Marie Walters was standing for Britain. And we said, look, last year we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the Battle of Lewisham. She's not going to speak. She's not going to be allowed to speak at the, at the local venue. And she wasn't. And to the sister who spoke at, right at the beginning about the fear of violence, there's an opposite reaction to that, and that is the feeling of liberation when you stop these scum from meeting and speaking. It's absolutely wonderful. Absolutely transformational. Because in the couple of years before that, we were attending uh, momentum meetings, and it was almost like, is anybody listening? Is the penny dropping? And then when Mar Anne Marie Walters tried to speak in Lewisham, those same people, they were physically blocking the entrance, there was bodies on the line, there was shouting, there was screaming. And in the end, the police actually rang Walters and said, it's not safe for you to turn up. And so the meeting was cancelled. That's point number one. Point number two. Um, Mike also mentioned the, uh, the two big meetings of the, uh, well, certainly the, the big one of the DFLA, well, the 15,000 one. I'm not underestimating the fear factor, because it was scary. We were heavily outnumbered. And on that same evening, that, that, that same day, that same evening, we had a Lewisham Together rally in Lewisham with a local mosque, etc. And we were talking to local politicians, the mayor, uh, Vicky Foxcroft, the MP, and just telling them how scary it was. But nevertheless, it had to be done. Only a few days ago, I was on the, under, on the overground train, sat with my head in a book, and then all of a sudden, a group of school kids come on. And two of them came up to me and said, I remember you. Oh, where do you remember me from? You did a talk at Lewisham together. And these were Muslim girls, by the way, and their teacher was Muslim as well. And we Can had a discussion. Up, All right, we had a discussion um, about the Lewisham together, about Anne-Marie Walters, and about uh, opposing Robinson on Saturday. So the fear's there, but the liberation's there as well. But we've got to grasp the nettle. How we beat fascism is by numbers, absolutely. Uh, so it's absolutely vital that we get as many numbers as possible out on 14th of July. We also need the right strategy, and the work that Unite Against Fascism, working with the trade unions and others over the years did, in pushing back the EDL is significant, and I think we need to remember uh, a lot of the lessons from that. Push back the BMP as well. That was a process. There was a time... It's, it's hard sometimes to imagine now when you look at the rump that the EDL is today. There was a time only a few years ago that the EDL were literally getting thousands of people out in the streets on their demos uh, across Britain. And actually, the truth is, there were times when we were outnumbered on some of those demonstrations. Many times we outnumbered them as well. But eventually we pushed them back, we stopped them, because this was part, part of a process. The 9th of June far-right demo was bigger. And we need to continue to, to build Unite Against Fascism and stand up to racism. And as I say, first of all, that means getting as many people out on the 9th of June. But also, there's the uh, International Anti-Racist Conference that Stand Up to Racism are organising in London uh, on the 20th of October. It's vital that people go to that, and I'm asking as many people as possible to sign up for that before they go home today. Because what we're seeing is... Uh, my own people mentioned it. On 9th of June, there was support from the Front National, the, the French Fascist Party for Tommy Robinson, from Geert Wilders, from the uh, Freedom Party in Holland, the, uh, uh, the far-right Islamophobic party there. And this is what's happening across Europe. The fascists are trying to connect up. Tommy Robinson, by the way, is someone who makes great play of claiming that he's not anti-Semitic. Robinson went on a demo, a fascist demo in Poland, only a few months ago, 
which was fully anti-Semitic, involved chanting anti-Semitic slogans and so on. Across Europe, we're seeing the mainstream right inviting fascist organisations uh, into office. We see this in places like Italy and Austria. And you just mentioned those countries. These are countries that experience fascism you that, and experience please? the Holocaust. After the Holocaust, we said never again. We need to carry on that pledge. On Saturday, we say never again. So after this, comrade, this will be the last speaker, and I'm going to get um, Michael to sum up. I've got a couple of announcements as well. Hi. Uh, um, sorry, I'll just make it brief. Basically, um, like, uh, as Michael said, when, uh, when we were in, uh, whatever day it was, in, back in June, we're, we're in Whitehall, you know, where there was 15,000 of them. I mean, there was a few things to point out, really, from that day, sort of reiterate, really, but, you know, that, they, that it's not a cohe quite a cohesive movement yet. There's lots of different organisations vying for the leadership of that group of people, that 15,000. So we do have, at the moment, a kind of window of opportunity, really, where they're mobilising large numbers, but they don't have the confidence yet to be able to march against, you know, in some town somewhere or through some area that, you know, with a higher Muslim population or whatever. They, they're trying to, at the moment, build up their confidence within a relatively neutral space of central London that they can, you know, encourage themselves, build up, build up, build up, until the point when they feel confident enough. They don't feel confident enough to take us on on the Friday. That's why they're called the Saturday. So we, we see that they're, they're very, very um, kind of strategic about how they're trying to build up, but they don't quite yet have that full confidence. You know, the memory of the EDL getting defeated is still in their mind, you know, so... We have this opportunity at the moment to break them before they start to crystallise into a large organisation. I mean, people talked about so, how some of the uh, sort of YouTube fascists are kind of starting to join UKIP. So you can see how things are starting to kind of come together. But at this moment, as we stand at the moment, there are, you know, the, the FEA, the DFLA, the UKIP, everything else. So there is a, a contingency of different organisations. So we do have a moment, really, where, we're, we, you know, if we can start to build quickly, you know, we can. And, um, break that, that unity that they've got at the moment. And obviously the other thing is that obviously around Tommy Robinson, if he comes out, he may have the ability to combine lots of these organisations together and, and form a, a more cohesive, tight coalition around him. So with him, not, with him out of the picture and him as this sort of Masonic figure or whatever, we do have that kind of opportunity. The other thing I wanted to put very quickly was... Um, on building from Friday to Saturday to the anti-Trump demo to get people on Saturday, which is that the, there's 200,000 200, plus people on the Facebook group for the Trump demo. So if people can get on there now and start talking about Saturday, that can hopefully pull people from that. Sat Friday's a little bit too late because if you've got people coming in from outside London and everything else, they can't then come back down the following day. We've got to start making sure that people are coming, if they're coming into London, they come in for the two days now as opposed to making sure on the Friday. So I can, if I can urge people to get on that, there is a, you know, there is a, a collective audience there, 200,000 plus people on that page. Thank you. Uh, Jim Nicholl, I'm in the SWP. I don't want to frighten you, but I'm telling you that unless we drive these people off the streets, then we're going to be sorry. Because there is a vast number of soft racists who support Robinson. I've spent a long time on YouTube. These people organize under the radar. So I'm only talking about YouTube, not about Facebook or anything like that. If you go onto these hard sites, and there are 10 or 12 hard sites, you'll find the following. Tommy Robinson speaks at the Oxford Union. I've watched all one hour, eight minutes of the bile. One million people have watched that. Tommy Robinson takes on Lily Allen because Lily Allen goes to Calais and helps refugees. The bile that that gets. 1.2 million people have clicked onto YouTube. Tommy Robinson does a five-minute face-to-camera on a subject which is entitled Let's Be Honest About Grenfell Tower Fire, in which he says, yes, I've got three kids. You know, I'm against kids being burned, but one report says 46 illegal immigrants are found in one flat. 
We know that hundreds of illegal immigrants are being given properties in Grenfield Tower. We know that the people who have survived Grenfield Tower um, are being given luxury flats in Kensington. You've got to read this. 305,000 people watched that. This is a hard right-wing site. So there's this, his own petition, by the way, his own petition is now standing at 627,000. So it is serious. It is serious. At the moment, these people are passive. But these are the people that he wants to tap into. And it won't be 15,000 people marching down the streets of Whitehall. It'll be 15,000 people in Manchester and Newcastle and York and various other towns. So they're passive at the moment. We can't be passive. We've got to be out on Saturday. We've got to drive them off the streets before they get through to this support. Right, four minutes. Uh, the, the first thing is what the comrade raised about, about the demonstration stuff and safety and the rest of it. The truth is, is that um, personally, not being, not, not being one of the greatest street fighters on earth, right? I think anybody who goes out to these things can be really nervous about it. That's the point of why they're organising the way they do. The thing we're going to do on Saturday, so people are absolutely clear, is there's going to be a demonstration going to Whitehall. We're assembling at Old Palace Yard. That will be stewarded. It'll have speakers. It'll have DJs, etc., etc., and stuff. So we're we're assembling in a spot where we can do it, right? So over, and then we're going to march into Whitehall and stuff over it. And I think that will be a that will be a safe thing, and we'll be organised, and we'll make sure that you can go there, whatever you, you know, whatever you're feeling about it and stuff over it. That, that that that's that's important. But the big thing of it, and the discussion really, is all the time now is about numbers, right? So over it, and that's why the wider discussion is so important. See, the, the thing is, is that when we talk about people talk about it, when people talk about the anti-Nazi League and Rock Against racism and the massive mobilizations that happened against the National Front and they talked about the rest of it. It's as if, you know, the Nazis came along, um, people were really worried about it and there was this enormous response and we got rid of them. Actually, it was a really uneven process that went on for years with big political arguments about the strategy, right, stuff over it, with all kinds of political and cultural figures coming out and being sucked in to what the Nazis were doing and stuff over it. I mean, you know, at, at, at the time, stuff, the reason why Ra was launched and stuff was because of musicians coming coming out with the same crap that Morrissey came out with the other, the other day and the rest of it over. And the high points came from a lot of bloody hard graft and arguments and stuff with people that truly built a mass movement. I mean, Dean talked about his childhood. But I, I didn't have a left-wing childhood. I had a bit of a right-wing childhood, to be honest with you, and stuff over it. And the, the, the groups that I was around were the people who were shouting racist abuse at Dean, right? So they were my muckers when I was a little and stuff over it. And the reason why we got one away from that at the time was because when I went into Holloway School and I used to sit there, the place was fucking plastered in carnival posters. When we spoke, they didn't used to shut down on us, the teachers. They used to argue with us. And, and you know, a little story, by the time I left um, Holloway School and stuff over it, because of the evil influences of some of the teachers there... There were 10 members of the SWP in the sixth form and stuff over it. Well, don't tell anybody. They'll all get sacked. Well, luckily, they've often retired right about it. But in other words, you have to have a situation where you really do create a mass movement. And sometimes that's the big things. Sometimes it's the smaller things. And people talk brilliantly about what happened in Lewisham the other day, about what happened in Leeds, about what happened in Manchester and the rest of it. The sitting down of individuals, winning trade unions to support, talking to the Labour Party people and the rest of it. I do think, by the way, in the Labour Party at the minute, there is a real openness to this argument. A massive... Well, you don't get fucking Hillary Benn out, right? That's a favourite. Oh, no, no offence to him. But Hillary Benn came out yesterday on an anti-fascist demonstration because they're worried. And why are they worried at heart? Because they can see that on the street mobilisations will lead in to an electoral challenge. That's what it will do, right, it's over it, because actually they think it's all right to talk about the Brexit arguments in London, but what about Hull? What about Leeds? What about whatever? So they know the, the strategies around it. So we've got an opportunity to create a movement in a minute. And the truth is, if we don't shape the movement in this way, as a mass movement that sometimes is prepared to come out against the far right, other arguments will come to the front. And actually in most countries, anti-racist propaganda has been won as an argument, actually saying Nazis are Nazis, Nazis, fascists are fascists and we will mobilise against you, has been lost almost completely in a whole number of countries and stuff. So the tradition we're really fighting for is to do. And I think the thing, just to finish really, Saturday is very important. 
You know what I mean? We, we can't talk about giving people the confidence and stuff over it if what they see are the pictures of Robinson's lot chasing the old Bill off the streets on Saturday. That will not give people confidence. At the minute, they're not going to Wolf and Forest and they're not going to Tower Hamlets. But be clear, if they take over central London on a regular basis, they will be coming into the communities. And they won't be coming into the communities tentatively. They'll be doing what they thought they were going to do in Leeds, where they fucking go for the mosques and the rest of it. And we've said clearly, we are putting out a warning to the movement. You cannot allow this to happen. You cannot allow central London, which is, you know, we don't feel greatly for defending Whitehall personally, but you cannot allow central London into becoming a regular mobilising centre for fascists and the far right and the rest of it and stuff over. And that's what they're trying to do. And I do want to underline it. When Robinson gets out, this thing will roll. And that's why the UKIP types, all the rest of it now are part of it because they can see themselves rebuilding over that. So we want to create a mass movement, but it starts this week. It starts with us using the Trump demonstrations to say that, yes, we are going to mobilise against the world's number one racist, but when we get to Saturday afternoon, our side is going to feel good. Our side is going to feel like we made a step up. They're going to see us in much, much bigger numbers because they're going to know that the real forces inside our movement, anti-racist, the Labour Party, trade unions are starting to come out and are starting to marginalise them. It's really crucial. And i just finish with this, really. It's right. The number of people I know who are at Wood Green or Lewisham, right, and stuff over it, when they happened, it's absolutely right that Wayman said. There must have been tens of thousands of people, right? If you can say that you were standing in white on Saturday, whether you come from Lewisham or whether you come from Manchester or whether you come from Birmingham and the rest of it, you'll have something really proud to tell people about it because it'll be the birth of breaking this thing before it grows. We do not want to go down the road of Europe. Over lots of things I'd like to go down the road of Europe. Food, weather, all those kind of things. But we don't want to go down the road where we're yet another country that has a mass racist street movement. We can be a big part of putting a stop to that if we get the numbers out and we show that we're on the up on Saturday. Saturday.